you for joining tonight's info session on the Columbia River Treaty to hear the latest news on Canada-US negotiations and to learn about the process for modernizing the treaty in both countries. I'm going to wait just a moment as I see a lot of folks still joining us. So we'll give it a minute for folks to join in. It's wonderful to see so many of you here. So tonight's session is on the Columbia River Treaty. We'll hear the latest updates on Canada-US negotiations and learn about the process for modernizing the treaty in both countries. We also hope that you can join us for on June 15th for our next session, Exploring Ecosystem Improvements Through the Columbia River Treaty. This event is being recorded and will be available on the BC Columbia River Treaty website after the fact for you to rewatch or share with your friends. My name is Brooke McMurchy. I am part of the BC Columbia River Treaty team and I am pleased to be your host tonight. I'm joining you today from the territory of the Lagwangan speaking peoples, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations. It's also known as Victoria, BC. I also acknowledge with respect and gratitude the territories of the Tanaha, the Shkwapim, the Silk, Sokonagan, and the Sinaiix peoples and neighboring tribes whose territories span the Columbia River Basin. It's great to see so many of you here right now. There's about 150 of you listening in. I expect more will join throughout the evening. I invite you to take a moment to introduce yourself and share what location or territory you're joining from in the chat. So tonight we are uh, very pleased to welcome a suite of esteemed speakers that I will introduce before each of them begins. Right now, I'd like to take a minute and share how the evening will go. So we'll begin with some opening comments from leaders of the Shkwapmik, Tanaha and Silks Okanagan nations. And we'll also hear a message from the BC minister responsible for the treaty, Katrina Conroy. We'll then move into an update on Canada-US negotiations, followed by questions. After that, we'll take a quick break and then move into presentations on the process for modernizing the treaty in both Canada and the United States. After that, we'll have more time for questions. We will wrap up at eight o'clock Pacific time. And so a reminder how to ask a question in Zoom. Uh, please type your question into the Q&A box, or you can use the raise hand function at the time we start taking questions. Please do not type questions into the chat, They're gonna, they'll be missed. Uh, so please use the Q&A box. If there are folks who have phoned in, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. That's if, you, if you've used the 1-800 number or the toll-free number. If you uh, do choose to speak, you'll receive a message saying that you can unmute yourself. So press star nine and then wait for a further prompt. Many thank yous to those who sent us questions in advance. We'll read those questions out as well during the question periods and we'll alternate between those questions and the ones that you raised during this session. A few reminders to please be respectful of the people you're asking questions to. In the interest of time, try not to raise questions that have already been asked. And if you are verbally asking your question, please try and limit it to one to two minutes. That would be great. We'll try and answer as many questions as possible tonight. And those that aren't answered will be included in our summary report for this session after the fact. So without further ado, it is now my honor to welcome Kukpi Barb Kote of the Shushwap Band from the Shukwapmik Nation to say a few opening words. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Um, CRT negotiations are important to the Sequemic for many reasons. The CRT was negotiated without Sequemic representation, representation or any Indigenous representation and has been the largest cultural impact to the Columbia Basin Indigenous peoples since contact. The Indigenous peoples are the rights and title holders of the resources required to conduct hydro and flood control operations. These operations come at a considerable expense to the Indigenous nations' rights and titles and have not been addressed or compensated to date. 
The nation has never ceded those resources, but suffered the impacts of their loss in profound ways daily. The renegade renegotiation of the, the CRT has enabled the Indigenous people the opportunity to bring their values forward and to be at the negotiation table to ensure those values that were previously disregarded are held accountable in a new CRT. It is acknowledged the three nations are valuable contributors at every level and every topic in the ongoing negotiations. We Indigenous people are proud of these contributions and thank the creator for blessing us with the strong hearts and minds to do so. Our participation is monumental and precedent setting. UNDRIP is recognized now by both Canada and BC. They have plans on how to implement. Lacking is a direct relation to the Columbia River and the reconciliation that needs to occur in the basin. It seems like an easy button to addressing reconciliation brewing for over 80 years, in fact, 83 as of this year. CRT and salmon restoration are inextricably linked and must define themselves as such in a new CRT. In front of us is the opportunity of a lifetime, an opportunity to broaden an international treaty so it encompasses the concepts and ideas needed to be inclusive to more than flood and power generation, an opportunity to join two sciences, Western and Indigenous to achieve operations reflective of a healthy river, an opportunity to aid in the recovery of a river that was once the largest salmon run in the world, an opportunity to have the basins people reconnect with the resources so vitally important to their cultural survival and key to their health, an opportunity to have all of the values of the basin to be considered. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kukpi Kote. I'd now like to welcome Councillor Sandra Luke from the Yakunuki Tanaha Nation. Yes, Kisukukit, Gapiniskil, Hugaklik Sandra Luke, Hugakigafi, Yakunuki. I'm a band counselor for Yakunuki, also known as the Lower Kutney Band. I'm also the Lands and Resource Sector Chair for the Tanaha Nation. I've been the Lands and Resource Sector Chair since 2014. And going back even further, Dinaka leadership have been deeply interested in and committed to the renewal of the Columbia River Treaty. The Dinaka Nation will result, really hopes to reduce the impacts of the Columbia River Treaty operations on our cultural, our waters and our lands and Akhamis Gapigapsins all living things and to achieve some benefits through the renewed CRT. I live in Yakanuki near Creston and very close to the Kootenai River downstream of the Libby Dam and Bonus Ferry. Libby Dam has collapsed of the white sturgeon population in the Kootenai Lake and the Kootenai River. Wea in our language means sturgeon used to be very important to us and we hope a renewal treaty will result in improved river conditions for Ria and other species. Our community has been working to restore some of the wetlands on our, our reserve. I participate in the five governments negotiations advisory team and feel that we are making some progress towards achieving our shared goals for a renewal treaty. But my perspective, progress is far too slow. I am hopeful that the pace of the negotiation is accelerating. And I, again, thank you. I'm looking forward to the discussions this evening. Tachas, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Luke. And now I'd like to welcome Chief Keith Crow from the Seal Okanagan Nation. Well, I go home and peace not seal. I squeak loop again, can tell some milk of me, so i My name is Keith Crow. I'm the Chief of the Lower Smoking Union Band. I've been involved in the Columbia River Treaty negotiations for about six years now. 
Um, I just want to thank the presenters that came before me. Um, it's been an honor to work with the other nations on this and speaking with one voice. It's something that's been long overdue and I'm glad we're doing it. Uh, Columbia River Treaty is one of the biggest infringements within our territories. The infringement of the treaty that we were never negotiated with us and we we're never part of. And the benefits that Canada and BC have received from this treaty are tremendous. But yet again, here we are, we haven't, uh, nothing has come out this way. I just wanna say I am in Castle Guard tonight. I am here, I'm here to do cer uh, ceremony tomorrow, salmon ceremony, and I'm just honored to be back in my old stomping ground. I grew up just down the road from where I'm staying right now and uh, went to school for a few years. So it's nice being back in this area. And I just wanna reach out to everyone who's out there and say, Thank you for attending tonight. Thank you for putting the time in to hear us and see what's happening. Uh, there is so much on the go. And I just, it's been an honor to be part of this. And uh, I just want to put a plug out there for the Columbia River Salmon Restoration Initiative as well. I think cursory is another major piece to the CRT is bringing the salmon back up to Columbia all the way into the Upper Arrow. That's another goal of the Silk Nation and the other nations. We've been working together on that as well. And I just want to say Lim Lim, and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you so much, Chief, Chief Crow, and to uh, Kukbi Kote and Councillor Sandra Luke. Thank you all for your words and starting us off in, in a good way here. Um, really appreciate your participation tonight, as always. Uh, great, great words and, and a great start to the evening. We'll now hear from the BC minister responsible for the treaty as she sends her regrets, uh, Minister Katrina Conroy. Uh, she's unable to make it in person, but we do have a video message from her that we will share now. Hi everyone, and, and welcome to tonight's information session on the Columbia River Treaty. I'm grateful to have this chance to speak to you remotely from my home away from home here in Victoria on the traditional territory of the Kwangan speaking peoples, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. As many of you know, I'm a long time resident of the Columbia Basin, having lived there for more than 50 years. So I'm very aware of the effects of the Columbia River Treaty, what it has had and continues to have on our lives, livelihoods and culture. So now we have an unprecedented opportunity to work together to build an improved, modernized treaty. A treaty that has been built on extensive and exclusive engagement with the people of the Columbia Basin is in the process of being developed collaboratively in partnership with Indigenous nations that will help us protect vulnerable and valuable ecosystems and combat and mitigate the relentless forces of climate change that brings social and economic benefits to people and communities on both sides of the border and enhances the close bilateral relationship between our two countries to make it even stronger. The potential of this opportunity for positive change is reflected in your participation in tonight's events and in our commitment to engage with the people of the basin so you can clearly understand and stay current on the work we are doing to modernize the treaty. We started this process in 2012, connecting with people through virtual and in-person meetings, social media, newsletters, emails, letters, and one-on-one -on -one phone calls with interested citizens. We've been working closely with the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee, the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee, Basin Citizens, and organizations to discuss the future of the treaty, to find out what the issues are and, and explore ways to address them. The Tanaha, Shuetan, and Silk Okanagan nations are an integral part of the process and have been working as equal partners with the governments of BC and Canada since February 2018 to develop and, and refine negotiating positions and strategies that, that will benefit all of us. The full participation of Indigenous nations in the treaty modernization process, it, it's an important and unprecedented step in implementing Canada's and NBC's commitments to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and to our journey towards reconciliation. And I want to thank everyone from the Canadian and BC delegations and from the Tanaha, Shuepan and Silk Okanagan nations for their presentations tonight. 
and a special welcome to Barbara Cossens from the University of Idaho, who will bring us her insights on the U.S. process for modernizing the treaty. Wish I could be there to see you, Barbara. I've always really welcomed your presentations. So thank you again to everyone who is calling in or, or joining us online for your interest in and contributions to our work on the Columbia River Treaty. Together, we can build a better treaty that meets the needs of the people of the basin and respects Indigenous rights. Thanks so much. Wonderful words from all of our leaders uh, to set us up for the rest of this session. Um, I'll do a little number check it now. Looks like there's close to 200 of us who have joined the conversation. And so thank you once again for everybody who's joined in tonight. Um, let's get started. So I'm now pleased to welcome Canada's Chief Negotiator for the Treaty and Consul General of Canada in Denver, Sylvain Fabi, who will start our, our, our session on the Columbia River Treaty negotiations update. Sylvain? Good evening, everybody. Um, I was just trying to make sure that uh, I was unmuted because after two years, uh, we still forget sometimes and and then it doesn't work well. So um, hello everyone, it's great to meet you this evening again. Yeah, it's still unfortunately virtual, but it's better than, 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 than not meeting. And I hope all of you and your loved ones are keeping safe and healthy uh, as we try to, you know, get over this pandemic and, and try to start working in, in the new normal, which is still to be defined. Now, the first thing I'd like to do, of course, is, is acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Denver, uh, Colorado, which is the traditional territory of the Ute, the Cheyenne, and the Arapaho people. And of course, I'd like to recognize the territories of Tunaha, Silk, Okanagan, and Sequepim nations and their people because we have to remember that the work that we're doing together on this issue directly impacts this region and the people. Thank you, Chief Crow, Cook P. Cote, and uh, Councillor Luke for your words of welcome for us all. And um, thank you, Minister Conroy, for, again, your consistent support for this long process to modernize the Columbia River Treaty. We're pleased that you continue to be the minister responsible for the CRT. So now about the negotiations. I know we have many speakers, so I'll, I'll try to talk briefly and, as, uh, and then save time for the Q's and A's, which is often where the good exchanges happen. So <clears throat> I'm gonna take a sip of water. I'm talking to you with my COVID voice. I un unfortunately caught COVID, but since we're working at home, it doesn't seem to be changing much. So here we are. Canada hosted the last round of the CRT negotiations, round 12, with the US on January 10th of this year. And this round, you may recall, occurred a year and a half after Canada had presented its first proposal on a renewed treaty to the US. So before that, it took a year and a half over the election, et cetera, for the US to, to be ready to meet with us again. The formal rounds of the negotiations, 12 in total, have seen, it is true, slow progress, and have shown us the multitude and the complexity of the issues where we have to, to agree on and discuss. What we've done and will continue to do is insist on ensuring the benefits created by the treaty from the Canadian treaty dams and reservoirs are properly accounted for and shared equitably between our two countries. That's the premise of our positions with the, with the US. And as we've mentioned before, um, <clears throat> and for those who are attending a public consultation for the first time, we remain open to providing flood protection downstream in the US and continue. we continue also to see merit in cooperating on power. These are the elements of the current treaty, right? We've also said 
that for a modernized treaty, we want to ensure greater domestic flexibility in Canada to support ecosystems, indigenous cultural values, and socioeconomic objectives in the Canadian Columbia River Basin. And we have included this priority in our proposal and in all of our discussions with the United States. We of course continue to work closely and collaboratively as the Canadian team with British Columbia, the Tunaha, Silk Okanagan and Sequepem representatives on our team to develop these positions and press ahead. It's important. I, I, this sounds like just motherhood and apple pie sentence. It's not <clears throat> everything we do, every position we put forward and defend with the United States is discussed, developed, and agreed upon between Canada, British Columbia, the Tunaha, Silk Sokanagan, and Sequepem representatives. Always, right? There's nothing unilateral on this. And of course, BC, Tunaha, Silk Sokanagan, and Sequepem, they also get the information from their own constituents on what they want to see in the treaty. And also our group, <clears throat> the negotiation group has, has met often with, as we do tonight, but in, in other, in other uh, formats too, to, to talk directly to other stakeholders in the basin to hear what they have to say. And I, I'm, I'm telling you, everything you say is considered and, and we try to make it as part of our negotiation positions. So in the last couple of months, however, and to look at options for making progress, Canada initiated the idea of, of small group sessions to sit down with the US more informally to discuss and ask questions and seek clarifications on issues in our respective proposals in 2020. And we do that because we want to help foster a better understanding of where each side is and to try to find areas to advance negotiations. These small group sessions are not negotiation sessions, but this is where we exchange in, in a more open and loosely defined format, uh, back and forth on, on ideas um, presented by, by um, each parties and to try to better understand. And because some of these things are, as, as I'm sure you, you, you will appreciate, it's they're very complex and they sometimes take more than one shot at in order to you know really grasp what what is being presented our first small meeting group uh, took place on march 30th in washington it was face to face washington dc and we were seven people on each side including representatives from of course our indigenous nations and we had some pretty frank discussions and, and my conclusion after that is that this was one of the best meetings we'd ever had. Even though it wasn't a negotiation, it was a really good uh, meeting which on which we can and will build upon in our negotiations. We have since continued with the small group format and met again on April 17. We will meet again tomorrow, May 17, and then towards the end of May, right? And each of these meetings is meant to elaborate elaborate on some of the more contentious and complex issues of our respective, respective proposals and to find some common understanding. And these are half day, smaller meetings as opposed to formal two day negotiation sessions. Nevertheless, by, at the end of May, we will communicate the key elements of these recent discussions. And we're aiming to hold a formal round of negotiation at some point this summer, likely in early August, but more to follow on this. And, and I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again. We all need some patience, starting with me, uh, to get through these negotiations, but there is commitment on both sides. And of this, I can assure you, I am convinced. There's, there's commitments, a commitment to, to try to reach a, a um, negotiated agreement, a modernized instrument that will satisfy both sides as much as possible. And I would like to end my formal remarks by thanking all of you for remaining committed to this process, for staying patient, and for keeping both myself and BC accountable and on track 
to obtain uh, the best possible agreement for Basin residents and for Canada. So with that, I'm happy to take at one point your questions at the appropriate time. Thank you again for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Sylvain. Kathy, over to you. This is Kathy Eichenberger, Executive Director of the BC Columbia River Treaty Team and also the BC Lead on the Canadian Negotiation. Kathy, go ahead. Thank you. So hello. And uh, thank you for all of your spending uh, a few hours of your time with us this evening. Uh, we're really uh, stoked about the number of people who are tuning in. And of course, those who aren't able to will be able to view the whole session, which will be on our website uh, later on. So first, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Victoria, British Columbia, on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations. And thanks, Yvay, for giving the uh, update on negotiations. I'm just going to add a few words and uh, not to repeat what others have said and to give time to uh, uh, our, my negotiating uh, teammates and uh, for Q&As. So uh, on, the, on the pace of progress, while, while the progress might seem, seem slow, um, progress is being made. And uh, especially after re-engaging uh, in, in December of, of 2021. Um, and I know that often people have said, well, we read your information bulletins after each session, and they always sound the same, um, that uh, it's a repeat of one another and there is no real information in them. But what I'm telling you is that, you know, there are nuances and there are shifts that are signaled in, in those information bulletins because the real just details of the negotiation sessions can't be made public. It would disadvantage both countries if we did uh, that at this point. But if you read the information bulletins in, in over time, you will see that over the 12 session, uh, sessions, there have been uh, shifts and, and the nuances should be encouraging to you. You'll see new things develop as you go along. Um, and, and they are on our website. Um, but at the same time, people on both sides of the border are concerned about you know, the progress and the prospects of uh, reaching a, a positive and a comprehensive agreement before September 2024. Uh, when the current flood control provisions expire and it changes from a, a planned, assured flood control regime to a, a more ad hoc called upon scenario that would affect operations in, in both countries. Um, Sylvain reiterated that we're open uh, to collaborating on a renewed flood risk management regime that, that protects downstream areas. However, to provide this benefit, we expect that it's valued appropriately and that we're also able to achieve the increased flexibility in the other areas of the treaty that uh, Sylvain mentioned for our own domestic goals, including uh, ecosystem benefits and indigenous cultural values and socioeconomic objectives. Considerations that were not talked about uh, in the original treaty. And so when people ask, how likely is it that the two sides will uh, reach an agreement in time. Um, Sylvain said, there's no deadline for negotiations to be complete, but we are rolling up our sleeves and uh, to reach an agreement as soon as possible. But, and this is an important but, we need to reach an agreement in which both, both countries are satisfied that the treaty will serve them well now and in the future. If that's not the case, if a treaty or an agreement isn't fair to both countries, the modernized treaty won't endure. It will fall apart and in not too long. So that means that for us, at least in Canada, the shared benefits and flexibility to meet our domestic objectives will need to be sufficient to make ongoing treaty operations worthwhile. And the US has their own uh, interests and objectives as well. Um, however, being at the table, I would like you to know that there is tremendous goodwill on both sides of the negotiating table to develop a treaty that I hope we can be all proud of, or at the very least, a treaty where everyone will acknowledge and recognize that it's better than where we are today with the current treaty. So it's complicated, it's very hard work, 
definitely worthwhile. And it is taking the time, hopefully not too much time, but taking the time to get it right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Now I'd like to welcome Nathan Matthew, who is the Shkwetmik Nation representative on the Canadian negotiation delegation. Welcome, Nathan, go ahead. Well, speaking to you from uh, Sakwam territory, uh, and thanks for the invitation to share some of the Indigenous perspectives on the renegotiation of the Columbia River Treaty. And it's, uh, it's really important stuff, you know, to, to speak and participate in, in ways that we can transform our world and make it a better place for everybody by working together, sharing and, and coming to uh, what we, we be, believe is a, is a better place given the, the circumstances that we're, we're facing as people today. And uh, a number of the, the key ideas uh, around the Indigenous perspective have already been uh, mentioned, uh, so I'll try not to hit everything too hard. I know that uh, many uh, uh, of the viewers are familiar with some of the some of the issues, and uh, but I think it's worth uh, retelling a little bit that the the treaty and the construction of the dams are are, are truly uh, the biggest infringement on uh, the lives of uh, Indigenous nations uh, ever in our history. And uh, some of the discussions that we have in terms of how to how to reconcile and how to how to bring things up to date in terms of the current uh, commitments of government, it's a, it's not easy. So uh, it's, it's a it's a really uh, great challenge. And the uh, going from non existence of, of rights to to the really quite clear uh, statements of government that they're going to uh, reconcile uh, with the current uh, constitutional and legal frameworks that are out there is a is a is a really uh, a big task. Uh, we do have uh, Canada and BC uh, signing on to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and uh, that's a that's a lot, and. It forms a, a big part of the challenge of transforming sort of our our, our relationship, uh, and it's made it a lot easier on our side because we we now have something to talk about uh, and that's uh, uh, respected. And uh, one of the big things in terms of that that declaration is uh, Article Nineteen, where uh, governments are expected to uh, obtain our free prior and informed consent before they make decisions uh, either legislatively or administratively that uh, have to do with with our interests so the the expectation is that we're going to agree to this uh, treaty and uh, the, one of the biggest ideas uh, is that the through the UNDRIP is that the governments recognize indigenous peoples have the rights to the lands, the territories, and the resources that they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used. Article 25. And uh, indigenous peoples have a right to redress by means that can include restitution or when that's not possible, just, fair, and equitable compensation. So, uh, and that's Article 28. Article 29, and they all sort of run together, is that uh, Indigenous people have the right to the cons conservation and protection of the environment and productivity of their lands. So we have some pretty big ideas of forming or providing a, a framework for, for the discussions that we're having in terms of how and what we're going to talk about in terms of Indigenous interests. And uh, in terms of, of going through this reconciliation, and uh, Sylvain and others have mentioned it, we uh, as Indigenous uh, nations have been included in all the, all the uh, negotiation activities, the planning, the strategies, uh, the pre-meetings, the, the meetings themselves, and uh, sort of the post-meetings. So we have a, a very 
a good front row seat to, to the negotiations and we're included and uh, we can speak uh, uh, when we want in, uh, in terms of the strategy and stuff. The, the main table uh, discussions, it's, it's very structured, and, uh, but we, we do have participation. And uh, uh, the idea that uh, the cultural and ecological values are key issues for negotiation are, uh, are now part of the negotiation. And uh, we're actually talking um, ideas about, you know, the, the uh, benefit sharing and uh, reintroduction of salmon, which will be, these ideas will be uh, further, further uh, identified in further uh, presentations here. And uh, how, how Indigenous voices, how our, our representation can be made in, in future decision making about how the system actually works. So how do we uh, participate in uh, together with Canada and British Columbia and the United States in how the rising and the falling and the flowing of the water through the system impact Indigenous interests and how those operations can be changed so as to provide greater benefits and greater health uh, to Indigenous peoples and uh, health to the uh, ecological environment. And we really come uh, from a, a pretty different perspective in terms of values uh, with our long association with the land and uh, our, our own selves for a very, very long time. Uh, we have a, a very clear responsibility to protect the health of, of the land and, and the resources. And uh, in traditional way, we have words and phrases that, that sort of show us the way. Uh, in in Sahuap machine we have as much like silks and the Tanaka words like quant quant. We have an obligation to respect our natural world. We have to become a little more humble to them knowing that our our health and well being depends on the health and well being of, of that natural world. And words like very directly tectameta respect the earth. And others like Knukwantwach, help one another do things. So when we talk about what are your laws, well, they're sort of like that. We're, we're coming from that place. And uh, we're pleased to uh, participate in uh, this uh, really interesting and important negotiation. Cook Stamp. Thank you so much, Nathan. I'll pass it over now to Jay Johnson, who is the Silks Okanagan lead on the Canadian negotiation delegation. Go ahead, Jay. Why? Well, um, my name is Jay Johnson. I'm um, actually coming to you from uh, the uh, Tuasin Nation territory. Um, had to pull over to uh, to engage in this as I. Uh, um, forgot in the post-COVID environment that there are more and more people traveling on ferries these days and I was delayed a ferry ride so I'm not in a, a nice uh, comfy office right now but um, nonetheless I'm, I'm honored to be here today and and um, very appreciative of everyone's time and interest in something as important as the Columbia River Treaty. Um, as you all know many of you are uh, along the Columbia River or are involved in it or have keen interest in it and you understand how important the renegotiation process is for all of us and for the environments we, we rely on. Um, and uh, we've been involved uh, in the, the structure of the renegotiation process for, for many, many years. In fact, a couple of more decades and uh, in even longer, the nations and, and, and leadership and ancestors have been um, uh, pursuing a voice within the treaty and um, demand for more involvement in the decisions uh, that occur on their lands and on their territories to ensure that uh, the interests of their communities and just as importantly, the interests of the environment and those species that do not have a voice in these discussions are represented uh, as best as they can be uh, to ensure that um, the decisions that are made around the treaty and around the water system as one river are um, 
are the best ones for, for the environment, for the cultural values, for spiritual values, and for all of those of us that depend upon uh, the treaty and the benefits of the river system and its ecosystems around us. So um, I've been um, involved as the uh, chief negotiator and senior policy advisor to the Silk Okanagan Nation for uh, a little over 20 years now. Um, I grew up in the basin and, um, uh, and appreciate what the Columbia River Treaty was and the kind of impacts that it has had around the river system and around the, the basin, both north and south. Um, I acknowledge that we have been living with the industrialization of a river um, that has sought and um, achieved the harnessing of the power of the river for the purposes of hydroelectric uh, production um, and electricity that we all benefit from. Um, and it has also resulted in holding back uh, the freshets every year to uh, provide security downstream in the United States in particular for uh, floodplain developments and um, and high water marks and in uh, wet water years. So um, the treaty was really, as you all know, formed on those two bases, energy production and, and, and flood control. But it let, left out not only many voices in the basin and around um, the river, but also left out the environment and ecosystems and the cultural values that are so critically important to, to all of us. And um, we've been working really hard to ensure that um, the intentions of Indigenous nations that you've heard tonight are included in a, in a renewed treaty. Um, and, um, and we're very proud of where we've been able to, to go so far. You've heard tonight that we've had um, um, great success in becoming observers. I like to frame it as participant observers. Um, and you've heard from the chief negotiator, Sylvain Fabi, that, and from Kathy Eichenberger in British Columbia, that we have been deeply involved in, in the, um, the iterations and the twists and turns of, of uh, research and um, issues analysis and and um, positions and issues and negotiation discussions. And, and so we're very pleased with that. This is something very, very new and very, very long overdue. Um, the voice of Indigenous people in the decisions is critical and crucial and, uh, and is finally coming about in a way that will affect uh, the treaty in a, in a positive and uh, beneficial way. Um, some time ago, we, uh, through as Nathan mentioned, the um, United Nations uh, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, the adoption of uh, that same declaration into provincial legislation in British Columbia, and, um, and subsequently uh, the adoption in the federal government of Canada. We now have UNDRIP and also known as DRIP in, in BC enshrined in law. Um, to ensure that consent is required in these broad-based in, in decisions that need to occur on, on areas that affect Indigenous communities. And um, to that effect, we've had to wrestle with what consent means and what does consent mean to, to First Nations of the Basin in Canada. And in broad stroke ways, the, we seek to get um, uh, a variety of interests addressed and we've been our leadership has been very vocal in uh, describing what those are and and um, not necessarily a pathway to get there but certainly the interests that we're pursuing um, with great interest and great intent and and uh, with with um, um, with lots of action and uh, and broadly speaking those are benefit sharing um, so that the uh, the benefits that are accrued to British Columbia primarily from the the River Treaty are are shared appropriately with Indigenous communities, which, as uh, Chief Crow had had described, have, has never occurred before. Uh, indigenous communities and many of those living along the river system have had to live with the benefit with the burden and not the benefits, and so. Um, uh, we have yet to see progress on that, but we remain very hopeful 
and uh, and we pursue our discussions with uh, the federal and provincial governments on benefit sharing. Uh, governance is another aspect. Uh, a new decision-making regime around the treaty and its implementation is something that we'd like to see. Um, and uh, and also redress. Uh, you've heard that several times tonight. Um, that redress is a fundamental component of the UN Declaration. It's something that we seek. Um, to obtain as well in terms of mitigation efforts and restitution efforts in a variety of ways along the river system. Uh, and lastly, you've heard about salmon. And, uh, and salmon is crucially important to all the First Nations in, in Canada in the basin. Uh, um, Silk Sokanagan, of course, are, are salmon people. Um, the salmon is not, not just about sustenance and nutrition. Uh, it's also about um, cultural values and ceremonies. And bringing salmon back results in the reinvigoration of uh, social networks in terms of uh, distribution of food, uh, the ceremonies around the distribution of the food, the teachings from uh, elders to, to youth, the connection of youth back to elders and to community members. Um, all those networks that, that have... Um, not been active because of the lack of salmon are reintroduced and, and reinvigorated as a result of the salmon coming back and make stronger, deeper, healthier communities as a result. And um, that's something that we're very, very excited about. So to that effort, we are looking at uh, benefiting from the experience of the Silks Nation in bringing salmon successfully back into the Okanagan River system uh, for the last 20, 25 years. The nation has worked incredibly hard uh, and the leadership have worked very, very hard to ensure that salmon uh, find their way back up through uh, uh, the Columbia River and into the Okanagan system. And, and the sockeye salmon are now returning in numbers that uh, started with uh, around a thousand to hundreds of thousands of, of salmon now coming back into the system. And, and communities all through the basin and all along the river system are benefiting from that. So, so there's, it's tremendous effort. Uh, it was informed by indigenous knowledge along the way. It resulted in um, uh, the, the establishment of indigenous hatchery in, um, on Penticton Reserve for the nation and, uh, and, and tremendous growth in, in technical and cultural expertise. Uh, but none of that could have happened without strong connections with U.S. tribal groups and, and, and power entities that have supported this work. So um, um, none of us can do it alone. We all have to work together. We have to um, ensure that we keep our eyes on the prize and, and uh, build a healthier, sustainable future in years to come. And um, the last thing I'd like to talk about just quickly is the, the Columbia River Salmon Recovery Initiative is something that uh, probably many of you know about. It's um, uh, an organization that is only three years old now and is a result of all the, um, the, the three indigenous nations of the basin and uh, the provincial and federal governments working together under indigenous leadership, First Nations leadership to, uh, to bring the salmon back up into the, um, into the Columbia River. So uh, Lim Lim to everyone today and um, thank you very much and look forward to uh, to our future together. Thank you so much, Jay. And for those interested in learning more about the Bringing the Clam Salmon Home initiative, I've entered the website into the chat. Uh, I'd now like to welcome Bill Green, uh, Tanaha Nation representative on the Canadian negotiation delegation. Bill, go ahead. Thanks very much, Brooke. Kisa Pyukyut, who got quick Bill Green. Um, and thanks, Sylvain, Kathy, Nathan, and Jay, your hard acts to follow. Um, but I'd like to start by thanking the Tanaha Nation Council for the really great honor of working for the nation, the Tanaha communities and citizens on the renewal of the Columbia River Treaty. And thank all of you for the opportunity to present a, a perspective on behalf of the KNC on Tanaha Nation Council on negotiation progress. So then spoke a bit about the 18 month hiatus, um, US election, et cetera, and the aftermath of that. Um, but the hiatus is over and as of December, fully back at the table. And there now appears to be strong interest from both sides in working hard towards renewed CRT. And that is uh, Sandra Luke spoke earlier about frustration with the slow pace. We're happy to see 
you know, much stronger progress now. Um, what's also encouraging is that all five governments on the Canadian side continue to work together in a really collaborative way. And we're dealing with difficult and complex issues and this collaboration is not always easy, but it is good. And I think indeed the collaboration is getting stronger as we get deeper into the negotiations. And that's the only way it should go. So our work within the Tanaha Nation on the CRT is guided by two negotiation mandate documents, one developed by the Nation Council itself, and one a collective Indigenous Nations mandate that was developed and adopted by leadership from all three nations. Jay's spoken a bit about this. And now all five governments have been working together to make sure we're aligning our mandates. Um, so then spoke about the Canadian domestic flexibility concept, a really important concept. And the nation is extremely pleased to see that this concept is now being actively and carefully explored by both the US and Canada to address ecological, cultural, and other values. Uh, Jay spoke about salmon restoration. But I want to put a particular Tanaha Nation uh, context to that. It's a profoundly important cultural value for the Tanaha Nation, indeed for all of the Indigenous nations. It's a goal that we've been working towards for more than 30 years. And uh, I'm really happy to report that both sides are now starting to consider the important linkages between a renewed CRT and an Adramus salmon restoration. There's fundamental linkages there that have to be developed. And, but this is both CRT work, and as Jay explained, collaborative work between the five governments that we need to continue in its own right for many years to come, even beyond uh, signing a re renewed treaty. Uh, KNC, uh, along with the Sequimic and Silk Okanagan nations have been co-leading the CRT ecosystem restoration work, but with the really important participation and support of other governments and organizations, we've completed quite a few ecosystem function studies and from those have developed a set of performance measures that have, we then build into what's called the CRT planning model. And that's a computerized model we use for analyzing different CRT scenarios. The short form is CRTPM for planning model. And using that, we've begun the work to identify and evaluate alternate operating scenarios that would improve ecosystem conditions. All of this work is ongoing and much remains to be done, but even beyond that, it's a very important work to explore and evaluate scenarios will, which will achieve improvements across a wide range of values, ecosystem, cultural, socioeconomic, recreational, flood control, power production, and others to find uh, shared benefit across as many values as possible. Now, there is an opportunity to learn more about this. Uh, there's an, an online town hall meeting like this on June 15th, just about a month from now. Uh, if you go to the same place where you registered for this, you will find the link to that online town hall meeting and we'll be uh, delving in some depth into three of the key values, ecosystem values and function and uh, performance measures we've explored. Tahas. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks very much, Bill. That's great. Uh, and we'll be sharing a link to where to register for that at the break as well. So at this point, I want to uh, open it up for questions for all of our panelists, uh, as well as invite our panelists to turn their camera back on. Um, there's been a lot of questions in the Q&A box that have, some of them have had answers typed into them. So feel free to browse those and we'll pull some of those questions out to ask them with the group here after, in a little bit. But for now, I'd like to start with some of the questions we received in advance of this meeting. Um, the first one will go to Sylvain. And the question is, are the negotiations going to address future irrigation demands south of the border? The US South is running low on water from 
and the U.S. is known for building water pipelines to move it from existing sources to supplement demand. Are, are they addressing that issue as well as governments continually saying they listen to citizen concerns but will not reveal their negotiating strategies as it would supposedly hinder them in achieving their goals? Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so the first part of your question is, uh, uh, the treaty manages the flow and timing of water at the border for power and flood control so far, right? And, and under the treaty, each country is able to use water for their own domestic purposes as long as flow agreements at the border are met. So in BC, uh, I've learned that there are no significant water supply challenges in withdrawing water from the Kootenai and the Columbia rivers for domestic agricultural industrial use by and large. I mean, there could be some small issues. And, and given the, the, at least the prognostic that can be made um, for, for, um, for the future uh, on, on climate change, the climate change predictions, um, it, it looks like, um, you know, we're, we're not gonna be running out of water, at least in that part of the basin. So th this is not a topic, a topic we have discussed uh, with the Americans. Remember, the, the, the CRT is not about everything, right? It's about certain issues and we're, we're trying to reintroduce some issues, uh, not reintroduce, introduce some issues such as uh, ecosystems now, but we haven't talked about what, what um, each country does with water on their side. The second part is, um, um, what was the second part of your question again? Uh, so, so, so continue to say. So it was talking about how uh, the, our governments continually oh, say they yeah. listen to citizens but won't reveal their strategies. Well, the one thing I'll, I'll say a couple of things. It's not because governments don't divulge, uh, I, I don't like to use the word government. It's not because negotiators don't divulge their strategies that they're not listening to, uh, <clears throat> to constituents. Uh, that, 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 that's not true. And, um, and I can tell you that if I compare to when I joined my department 30 years ago, the level of openness and the sharing of information happening today is, 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 is unparalleled with, with uh, what happened before. Remember that um, your, each of your respective governments, like the BC government, the three nations government, the federal government, they represent you, they're elected by you. So, so it's not like people are, everything is done in the dark and, 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 and people are not consulted. We're doing consultations now, but I think you will agree with me that if I were to come at a meeting like tonight and say, oh, by the way, these are my strategies for negotiation that uh, I don't think it were, we would just be talking about uh, supposedly hinder us in achieving their, our goals. It would definitely hinder. I mean, this is a negotiation, right? So there's a certain amount of, of, of things that you can't say in the open in order to keep your positions whole and to make sure that you have the best negotiation stance and position when, when, when you negotiate with, with another party. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm very um, uh, confident in the level of openness that we have and the amount of consultation we do at every level of, of, um, of constituents. So I'll, I'll end here. Thank you, Sylvain. So the next question that we had, um, Kathy, I'll ask for you to answer this one. How have the ongoing socioeconomic benefits in the US that are provided by flow regulation in Canada being calculated? And then how have these benefits been used in the negotiations to determine any payments or obligations by the US to Canada for providing flow regulation into the future? Okay, well, um, I, as Sylvain said, can't uh, comment on the absolute specifics uh, of uh, the negotiations, but, um, you know, we agree that TREE has provided significant benefits to the U.S., uh, more than just power and, and flood control, but also for uh, irrigation, navigation, recreation, uh, etc. Um, 
And, and that's often been acknowledged by US stakeholders as well. So in 2012, we retained a large accounting firm, Ernst & Young, to analyze these benefits and assign a value to them. And then we also retained uh, Willis Re, which is a worldwide re reinsurance firm uh, to determine the range of potential avoided flood damages uh, as a result of the treaty. Or, or if the treaty would not be in place. So of course, we're not going to divulge the numbers tonight to you, but it is informing our positions. Um, and so uh, we, we do want to make sure that uh, people are aware of all of the benefits of the Canadian operations, treaty operations with you know, salmon population recovery, navigation and, and water supply and, and reliable uh, power production, as well as keeping uh, towns uh, safe from flooding. And so uh, it's these additional benefits and, and including the uh, fundamental or the core benefits from the treaty are being discussed uh, with the United States. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Lynn Panaya, who is part of the Global Affairs Canada team. She's been monitoring the questions being typed in here, uh, and I'll invite her to ask a question from the Q&A box. Go ahead, Lynn. Sure. Good evening, everyone, and thanks, Brooke. Um, so one of our questions is, how will terminating the agreement and using the called upon have negative effect to Canada? I can give this a try. And then Kathy can compliment. Um, first of all, called upon is is, is will have is not good for anybody, right? It, there's no doubt in my mind about this. It's certainly not good for the United States, but but also for Canada because um, it creates more uncertainty. And 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 with uncertainty in in anything else, whether it's managing a, a river or or, or, or managing a college or managing a business, it's, it's very hard to operate when you have a, a higher level of uncertainty because under called upon, the US would call upon us when, when they feel they, they need uh, under certain conditions and, and it would not be as predictable as what we have now, but it would certainly be bad for the US to, I am, I am entirely convinced of that. That's why we're seeking to, agree on a on a, um, a more predictable uh, flood control regime that would be good for, good for both countries and take into consideration an equitable sharing of benefits. Kathy, you may want to expand on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, the uh, called upon operations are uh, not well defined. And so uh, it's challenging to even know uh, how it would all unfold. Uh, and because of the uncertainty uh, on how would it Im uh, impact flood risk in the US and how uh, Canada, BC would have to op operate the dams differently, uh, that uncertainty is uh, what is challenging. Uh, we know that um, the uh, called upon requires the US to uh, uh, use more of their flood storage space in their reservoirs, but that includes Kukanusa, for example. So we don't know what the impacts might be there, but also in other US reservoirs. At the same time, if we have to, uh, if we're called upon to, to provide more storage, how quickly we would have to provide it, how soon, and, and what could the impacts be are, are all unknown. So that's where it's, it's uh, where there's not a clear answer to that because there is a lot of uncertainty on how it would all unfold. Thanks very much, Kathy. I see one person has their hand raised. So I will invite um, Brian to speak and then we'll go back to the questions we received in advance. Brian, if you're able to unmute yourself, let's try that one more time. All right, maybe we'll figure that out in just a moment. Um, there is somebody else who has raised their hand, so we will invite this person to speak. Harmanjeet? Yes, um, so Great. I'm Harmanjeet uh, from Penticton. 
So my concern is about the Smilkameen and Okanagan rivers. So I have read many places that they are part of the Columbia Water Treaty and many places it is mentioned that they are not part of the Columbia Water Treaty. So uh, uh, though the Okanagan River is managed, so we can maintain flow in this one, but the Smilkameen River, the flow is always natural and in August and September, the flow goes critically low. And uh, and there are having like issues like if there is a change in precipitation and we get less of water into the rivers and uh, and uh, there are changes in the water rights also how we will be what will be the guidelines for maintaining that water level at the boundary so that what we are supposed to maintain those things uh, are these negotiations going on yeah i can i can answer that and Sven, if you, you want to jump in um so the the okanagan and smoking rivers are a part of the physical uh, Columbia Basin, you are correct, but they are not influenced at all by the Columbia River Treaty dams per se. Uh, and so they, they flow into the Columbia Basin, but below the, the border. And, and so they're not, uh, they're not part of the Columbia River Treaty Agreement. They are operated through a, a totally different agreement. Um, and if uh, you want, uh, we could uh, follow up with you and provide you with more information on that. Yeah, thanks a lot because I'm uh, having some uh, uh, really technical issues in this area. So I will get to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you very much for your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so let's go back to one of the advanced questions. This next one is again for Sylvain. Um, so when the Columbia River Treaty was first signed, one of the American negotiators remarked, it was the sort of treaty you would impose on a defeated enemy, but they were willing to sign. Now we are told that the price the Americans pay was too high and that power and flood control and downstream benefits really aren't worth what the US paid and that we should be prepared to accept a lot less. While as taxpayers, we continue to shoulder the burden of paying for the dams. In other words, the great deal they got isn't really great. So we have to make more concessions, question mark. So the question they're asking is, will the government stand up for British Columbians and demand that American customers pay a fair price for power? The answer is yes. What that negotiator said, I don't care, right? I mean, your question in your question you're already answering it if it was so bad for us why are they coming back and and wanting to reduce it this is not about qualifiers that's not how we engage in our negotiation we are there to stand up and 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 negotiate for um for canada for british columbia for the indigenous nations in order to have an equitable sharing of, of the benefits. And, and that's, that's what we intend on doing. Now, there are things that we're asking for more, right? Like more flexibility on our, on our side, which, which will have to be included in the equation and will have an impact eventually on the electricity that the treaty allow, you know, allows for production in the US, not to the detriment of, of, flood, of flood risk management, of course, but that's what we're there for. We, what else would we be there? We don't engage in the negotiation by saying, "Oh, let's go, let's go, cave in and give everything." We're we're out there and and we're not caving in, and we want to make sure that what we get is equitable for us. Thanks so much, Sylvain. Uh, Lynn, I'll ask you to read one more question, uh, and then I'll go back to another question that we received in advance. And just a reminder, folks, if you're able to check the Q&A box, some of the questions have been answered to via text. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to every single one tonight. We're trying our best. And of course, everything not answered in this meeting will be responded to afterwards. Um, so Lynn, go ahead. What, what question do you have for us? Sure thing. Thanks, Brooke. Um, so this question comes from the US, excuse the ignorance, but for those of us from the US who are new to this, who are the seven members of the US team involved in the small group meeting? Who selected them and whose interests do they represent? Who would like to take that one? 
I don't, so, remember, I don't remember by heart who they are, but the chief negotiator is there, the representative of BPA is there, of the Army Corps of Engineer. Um, there was there was an indigenous uh, represent a, a, a tribal representative too. What it is is just a smaller group compared to the bigger group, and and maybe less lawyers and and more technical people. Because what we do in these small sessions is, is we really dig down on on the technical issues if in order to be able to dissect it, better understand it, so that when we sit down at the negotiation table, we're able to to um, to, to, to be in a better position to, to negotiate. On the Canadian side, it's the same organizations that are represented, but less people in order to facilitate a dialogue because when there's 25 people and sometimes more on each side, it's very hard to have a fluid back and forth on, on some very technical issues, even though at the end of the day, uh, I could choose as the chief negotiator to be the only one speaking, but I, I don't like to do that because I don't think it's conducive. We orchestrate our interventions, of course, but in a nutshell, it's the same organizations represented, the same the same groups, but a smaller a smaller number of them. Yeah, and and you know we we wouldn't even think of speaking on how what the the U.S. process is on. The composition of their delegation and so no. on. I think uh, I think uh, the people uh, U U.S. Uh, participants should should be contacting, frankly, their um, their own uh, representatives. And they they have a website. The State Department has a website, so maybe you can Google it, and it has good information. And you have the ability to to ask questions as well. That's great. Thank you. You too. Uh, so I'll go one more question that we received in advance. Um, so this one, Kathy, is for you. I'm born Canadian. Uh, I am Canadian, born in Calgary, and consider myself on equal terms with all Canadians. And ask our negotiators if you are going to stand strong and protect the vast areas in Canada that presently store water for the Americans, and is likewise managed by the Americans. Seasonally, areas of the Kukunusa and Arrow Lakes become nothing more than a wasteland, and the Americans complain they are giving Canada overpayment. Canada is being shortchanged, and I plead with you to the negotiators to stop being nice and take on an offensive strategy. Should the Americans not understand the impacts of Libby Dam operations and change the management of the dams on the Columbia River, we should build a weir on Kukunusa. We own the water and should demonstrate our ownership. Okay, thanks. And thanks for. Um... The people around Kukunusa who, who sent this question. Um, so we, we know and we acknowledge the big impacts in, in certain years about the reservoir fluctuations have on, on the people, the land, the plants, and, and the animals all around uh, Kukunusa. Uh, and the concerns of some of the residents, um, you know, uh, on the water fluctuations prompted uh, BC to commission this independent report on uh, feasibility of uh, uh, building a weir and this feasibility study was done in 2020 uh, for a weir or, or really would be a dam on Kukunusa. So after a detailed uh, review of this uh, preliminary study and we had also a town hall on it, the feedback that we received uh, generally and including a motion from the regional district of East Kootenays in 2021, uh, so, uh, uh, supported the, the uh, negotiating team that uh, to have as a first priority to most efficiently address uh, the concerns of Kukunusa Reservoir levels is to negotiate an increased coordination of Libby Dam operations uh, you know, at the negotiating table. And we will continue to do that. Um, as for uh, fluctuations in other reservoirs uh, to reduce, we are, uh, looking at that as part of the domestic flexibility that we are seeking. Uh, a lot of work is going into that. Um, and we know that that's a must for us to reach an agreement uh, for it to be durable. So uh, you'll hear a lot about the flexibility for domestic objectives. And, and it's something that is uh, new to the treaty for sure. And something that is, uh, I think, a, a, an absolute must for, for a modernized treaty. But um, Brooke, I would like to go to some of the questions regarding the youth involvement. Um, and I'm wondering if you can go to Sydney's question. Of course, thank you very much, Kathy. So uh, I'll, I'll read out Sydney's submission. 
hello, my name is Sydney McLean and I am from Golden, BC and now live in Kelowna. In 2019, I was a student in Wild Sites Columbia River Field School. I'm now a student at UBC Okanagan studying nursing. I'm passionate about health and equity. For both Canada and the US, the Columbia River impacts social and environmental health for many. I would like to know how the Canadian and American negotiating teams are listening to the needs of Indigenous populations, younger populations, and underrepresented groups to implement those findings in the modernization of the treaty. Great. So thanks, Sydney, for your question. And we need more questions from people like you and, and of your generation. So um, I, I can't speak for, for the US, but first off, I want to say that I can't say enough about how special Wild Sites Columbia River Field School is. I mean, talk about learning about the river from the river, uh, paddling it, speaking to Indigenous knowledge holders, politicians, ecologists, uh, and, and much more. And so we're quite proud to be one of the sponsors for the, the field school, and we, we're hoping that it can um, it, that it will continue. It, there was a, a, a hold during COVID, but it is a tremendous opportunity. Um, we're also very uh, impressed, so impressed with, uh, well, we don't want to spend a night uh, making plugs for Wildsight, but the Wildsight Teach the Columbia series. So a shout out to, to Graham Lee Rollins and his team. They developed a curriculum, uh, a whole package meant to help educators engage their students in many dimensions uh, of the Columbia River watershed, past, present, and future. And, and in a way that would be a lot more engaging than if bureaucrats like me would put together a PowerPoint or a paper. Um, I would really encourage people to check it out at the wildsite.ca uh, uh, programs teach to Columbia. It's, it's a very informative package for everyone, but they also have an interesting uh, mock negotiation set up that maybe Sylvain and I can learn something from it. Um, but we also have, uh, you know, in all our engagement meetings, virtual and person, where we've had entire classes from colleges and high school who've joined and participated over the years. And I would also give a shout out to the instructors Keep it up. You know, we'll soon be meeting in communities again and bring your, bring your students, bring your classes, assign homework on our, on our community meetings. Um, and we also have been going in person and virtually into the classrooms for an overview of what the CRT is, but even more interestingly, to have a back and forth discussion about what the students think uh, is important that we need to consider in our negotiations. In our latest virtual classroom meeting uh, it, it was Selkirk College with Canada's chief negotiator and myself led to a really lively discussion and we'd be happy to do a lot more of that. Again, teachers, instructors, we're waiting for your call. Um, so we also invite youth and, and including the Columbia River Field School alumni to participate in the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee uh, events. And we're always looking for youth members. We have, we use social media tools, YouTube, e-newsletters, Facebook, Twitter. And we haven't quite got into TikTok yet, but never say never. And people can always reach us uh, by phone by any means. Uh, we even have phone calls. People are surprised we pick up the phone and, and even people in California talk to us about the Columbia River Treaty. So with respect to how the uh, Indigenous uh, nations and Indigenous peoples are, are uh, involved, uh, you've heard about the collaboration of the five governments, including the three Indigenous governments and uh, their nations, they're, um, they're collaborating in everything that we do, but they also are reaching out to their uh, members, their communities on the CRT and its future. And we respect and we support all types of their engagement with their, in, in their own way, in a good way with their, with their community. So there's always a lot more to do. We're open for suggestions. Let us know which the best new ideas to connect with young people. And uh, thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy, and thanks, Sydney, for your question. Um, we're going to take a really quick break here so that we can move into our next set of presentations on the process for modernizing the treaty in both countries. So uh, we'll take a, a couple of minutes. Oh, go ahead, Kathy. And, and I'll, co I'll continue to answer questions in the Q&As during that time. Thank okay. you very much, Kathy. Really appreciate it. So keep an eye out for uh, Kathy's answers there. 
Um, we'll, we'll come back in about five minutes and uh, start ourselves up again. So thanks very much, everyone. Limna, thanks, Jane.
All right, everyone. Hope you had a chance to stretch your legs. Um, we'll get back to it here. And uh, I'm excited to share our next speakers, or rather introduce our next speakers, who will present on both Canada and the United States process for modernizing the treaty. Uh, Corey Olashanki is, I probably mispronounced that, I'm so sorry, Corey. Um, he is from Global Affairs Canada, and he will be presenting on Canada's process. So I'd like to welcome Corey to please share your presentation. Thank you very much. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Corey Olshansky. I'm, I'm a legal officer at Global Affairs Canada, and my responsibilities there include providing uh, advice, to, legal advice to the federal government on matters of international law, including as relates to the Columbia River Treaty. Uh, I'm joining you today from my home in Ottawa, and I'm not projecting my voice too loudly because on the other side of the wall behind me, my, my five-year-old is sleeping and I don't want to wake her, but uh, I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, and I'm in Ottawa, which uh, which is the traditional home of the Algonquin people, and I'm I'm calling. I'm speaking to you from there. Um, before I get into it too much, I'll also point out that uh, treaty law is not specifically my area of expertise, but I, I understand it well enough, hopefully, to explain to you what the process is in Canada and to be able to answer some of your questions afterwards. So we can talk a little bit about what uh, a modernized Columbia River Treaty would look like. And the truth is that nobody really knows what form a new treaty will take. We've already heard from some of our earlier speakers who were talking about some of the things that we are trying to put into the treaty. But what will the treaty look like? What will we uh, do to modernize it uh, from a legal perspective still remains unclear. And there are a number of different options. Uh, the options are, are, they're not limitless, but there are many of them. Uh, we could agree with the United States to amend some of the existing treaty. We could do what's called uh, an exchange of diplomatic notes with the United States. Uh, and a diplomatic note is essentially an official correspondence between two governments. And in these diplomatic notes, we can correspond with the United States and, and express back and forth what our understanding is of a new modified Columbia River Treaty, or we could start anew and we could prepare an, an entirely 100% new Columbia River Treaty that doesn't look anything like the previous one in, in terms of uh, not so much substance, but in, in terms of its form. Whatever we do though, whatever form it takes, whether it's diplomatic notes, whether it's uh, amendments or annexes or whatever we wanna call it, all of these things are still treaties. In international law, a treaty is any written exchange between governments made by people who are authorized to conclude such an agreement. So no matter the form, it's a treaty. And in Canada, uh, an international treaty must go through a process that, that I'll, I'll discuss right now. So how do we make a treaty in Canada? And in particular, how would we make the Columbia River Treaty? The treaty adoption process in Canada has a few steps that it needs to follow, and the Columbia River Treaty is no exception to these rules. And I'll talk about some of these steps and where we are in the process. So the first step is to determine whether or not we should negotiate. And, and we've already done that. We've determined that we should be in a negotiation with the United States. So the next thing we would do before we would ever meet with our negotiating partners, the United States, is to get permission to negotiate with the United States. And that's called a mandate. So a mandate for any treaty, including the Columbia River Treaty, sets out Canada's positions. And it's developed after a study of the issue, consultation with, with relevant groups, for example, the province of British Columbia, uh, indigenous groups, stakeholders in the region. And I, I should note this mandate is internal to the federal government. This is, this is uh, instructions that uh, public servants in the federal government will receive from ministers and from cabinet explaining what uh, their position should be in the negotiation. If we fast forward a bit, 
and we imagine that the negotiations, we have our mandate, we have permission to negotiate, we have our mandate, and now let's pretend that we've already negotiated and negotiations have concluded and we've, we've come to a, uh, some sort of a, an agreement with the United States. We'll have concluded a text with the United States. It'll have to be approved in, in English and French in both official languages. And then the next step would be to sign and ratify the treaty. So these are two separate important steps in the treaty adoption process in Canada. And basically, it, it requires the negotiators to get more permission, another mandate from the federal cabinet to do each of these two steps. So any mandate to negotiate requires uh, consultation, and so would a mandate for signing and ratification. It comes with study consultation with British Columbia, with the Indigenous groups and stakeholders in the basin to make sure uh, that, to confirm that uh, we have achieved our negotiating mandate. So what are these things? What is signing? What is ratification? So signing a treaty just means that we agree in principle with the terms that have been negotiated. It's not the same thing as ratification. Ratification would signal Canada's intent to be bound by the treaty. So these are two different things. Signature does not always lead to ratification. Ratification essentially means that Canada would indicate publicly and to the United States its intention to be bound by the treaty. And it happens after any necessary changes might be made to our laws if changes are needed. In Canada, before ratification of a treaty can take place, our treaty process has an extra step. And that's the step for uh, requiring the Minister of Foreign Affairs to table a signed treaty in the House of Commons for 21 sitting days before proceeding with ratification. And this period is meant to give members of Parliament an opportunity to debate or discuss the treaty uh, before it's ratified if they choose to do so. So there's a mandate to negotiate, then there's a mandate to sign and ratify the treaty, then it's tabled for 21 days, sitting days in, in, in the House of Commons, then the steps needed to ratify are taken. So that might include changes to laws, uh, creating Canadian legislation that allows us to do things or prohibits people from doing other things that might interfere with the fulfillment of our international obligations. And only then will the treaty be binding upon Canada. The treaty itself will indicate what its process is for entry into force to, to come into effect, essentially. It'll either have a specific date uh, set out, or it'll there'll be another one of these exchanges of diplomatic notes, this official correspondence between governments, one side confirming to the other that they consider the treaty to be in force. But this is this is a matter to be worked out uh, by the negotiators when when we get to that stage. And this is true. These steps are true pretty much no matter what form the treaty takes. So Columbia River Treaty negotiators, they're not at the step where they're discussing form. As you heard, we're, we're, we're deep into the substance at this point, and the discussion now remains about our content. So the key to the treaty adoption process in Canada is to receive the permission for each step and the tabling in the House of Commons. Those, those are the, the key elements, I think, to retain. And these are the steps that ensure that negotiators know what they must achieve and whether they've achieved their goals to the satisfaction of cabinet. And tabling in the House ensures that all MPs have had a chance to, to discuss the treaty if they want. Um, and that that pretty much sums it up. Uh, I understand I can take some questions afterwards, but uh, I don't want to I don't want to preempt Barb. So I'll I'll leave it there. That's great. Thanks very much, Corey. And I'll turn it over to Barb to uh, share the U.S. process. Thanks, Barb. Thank you. Um, well, I I would like to first thank all of you who have managed to to hang on to the to the bitter end here um, and thank you for being interested and in staying engaged in Columbia River issues. I'd also like to thank Minister Con Conroy for her kind words this morning. 
I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the Aboriginal hunting and fishing grounds of both the Nez Perce and Coeur d'Alene tribes. And these, this area then became the 1855 treaty lands of the Nez Perce tribe. Um, I'm a, a retired professor from the University of Idaho College of Law and my role in the Columbia River has been, I've participated in education on Columbia River Treaty issues for about the past 12 years. I do not have any official capacity in the negotiations and I do not represent anyone involved in the Columbia River Treaty negotiation issues. What I'm going to do today is briefly go through the process the United States adheres to in entering a treaty in international law. So the, the negotiation, the ratification, and then very briefly implementation. So on negotiation, the sole authority to negotiate a treaty lies with the executive. And the president generally does that through the Department of State. Um, the original treaty, for the Columbia River had a negotiation team that was led by the Department of State. It included representatives from the Department of Interior. There were already Bureau of Reclamation dams on the river and that's why Department of Interior would be interested. And there were representatives from the Army Corps of Engineers who also already had dams on the Columbia River for navigation. Also on the original committee, they had observers, um, members of the congressional delegation from the basin who served on the Senate Committee on Foreign Affairs participated. Today, it's, it's a much broader range of expertise on the team. And I can't speak to the question that was asked earlier about how they choose their team. I can only tell you the interest in the basin that uh, these various entities bring expertise on. So again, US Department of State is leading negotiations and the team consists of representatives from what are currently the two operating entities. So appointed under the treaty for the last 58 years, Bonneville Power Administration and the Northwest Division of the US Army Corps of Engineers have been the operating entities. They have represent representatives at the table. The team also includes, as it did the first time, representatives from the US Department of Interior. Um, there's really three entities within Interior that, that have interests in the basin, the Bureau of Reclamation, uh, again, because it has dams within the basin, particularly Grand Coulee, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which handles a lot of the, uh, the federal services to Indian tribes within the basin and across the United States, and then the Fish and Wildlife Service that has authority over resident listed fish species. So in the Columbia, that would be bull trout and uh, white sturgeon. Also from the Department of Commerce, they have no, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They have authority over anadromous fish species. So that would mean salmon and steelhead that are listed within the basin. The, the website, list that as the team and then says also present are uh, the U.S. Department of Energy, for obvious reasons, hydropower is a very important non-carbon source of energy, and expert advisors from three of the 15 tribes in the reservation, the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, the Kootenai Tribe of Idaho, and the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Reservation. So that's, that's who's at the table negotiating. Ratification, um, which as Corey said, is actually indicating the intent to be bound by the document that's negotiated, actually has three methods in the United States. Um, despite the fact that the US Constitution specifies the advice and consent of the Senate is required for the president to then ratify a treaty, in practice, that's really only one of three methods. The other two allow unilateral action by the president. Uh, the first one is in areas that are matters under the constitution of executive authority, and that includes within an existing treaty. So if a minor adjustment was made within an existing treaty, that can be accomplished through an exchange of notes um, that, that the president would undertake. The second 
method um, that doesn't require the advice and consent is with authority from Congress. And it's my understanding that that's a common method used in trade treaties, not necessarily water treaties. Um, the somewhat dated but still relevant 1984 study showed that 94% of the international agreements that the US entered into between uh, the end of, of World War II and 1972 were ratified under one of these two methods of unilateral authority. So how is the method chosen for ratification? The Department of State has a list of criteria to determine if the agreement rises to the level of advice and consent of the Senate. Those items include things like risk to the nation, um, need for formality, the duration of the agreement. But the things that are really of particular importance for a water treaty is first of all, past US practice. The original Columbia River Treaty went through the advice and consent of the Senate and the other water treaties the US has with Canada have done the same as have the water treaties that the US has with Mexico. There's two other in the related areas in the list of criteria that are very important for water and that is the preference of Congress and the effect on state law. Um, the Senate with its two representatives from each state, regardless of the population of that state, it is designed to reflect the interests of the states as political entities. And, and while certainly the Columbia River is of major importance nationally because of its hydropower production, because of its federally listed species, because of the tribes that reside in the basin and have interests in the water, um, it's also considered, water is always considered of particular importance regionally. So in terms of the preference of Congress, Congress would want to see an agreement on water. So that is the most likely way that a treaty would be ratified. The process of advice and consent, once negotiations are completed and result in a document agreed to by the negotiating teams, the president submits the treaty to the Senate and that treaty always goes to the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. That's the only, the only committee it can go to. That committee generally conducts a hearing. Uh, what's called discharge from the committee takes it to the Senate floor where it must receive advice and consent, which is a two thirds majority. That means 67 votes within the Senate. Key point on that is that two thirds majority means bipartisan support on the treaty, regardless of, of what happens in, in November elections. Um, the Senate can in that process impose conditions on its advice and consent. And if they do so, the president will bring that back to the negotiating session. If the treaty passes the Senate with at least 67 votes, it returns to the president and it's the president's signature that constitutes ratification. The president then exchanges an what's called an instrument of ratification with Canada. And the, the treaty enters into a force on the day at which the, the treaty specifies. So usually the terms of the treaty itself says how it actually enters into force. Finally, implementation, because very often uh, treaties are not self-implementing. There has to be additional legislation to implement them. So for example, in the original treaty, um, a Congress authorized uh, funding appropriations for a part of the grid that would tie in the Pacific Northwest with the US Southwest so that hydropower could be sold from the Columbia River Basin, um, particularly in summer to the Southwest, which, which has um, been a very lucrative prospect for the basin. Um, so if any aspect of a new treaty requires appropriations by Congress, that would go through the normal congressional process, a bill introduced in the House and the Senate approving it with a majority vote. So I will end there and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Barb and Corey for that um, 
yeah, we've heard a lot tonight about the process of uh, negotiating and as Corey put it in the details of negotiating what a modernized treaty could look like. And now we've heard what the what the, the process is in both countries to carry that forward. So thank you both for providing that context. Uh, so there's been a lot of questions flying in the uh, Q&A uh, section, um, and a lot of our panelists have been answering them in writing, but maybe I'll, I'll uh, raise one of the questions that came up um, and maybe invite uh, Bill to answer. I know he typed in the response, but I think it's a good one to clarify. Uh, so we, we heard both countries and their process for modernizing the treaty. The question is, how are groups at the table ensuring that Indigenous values and priorities like ecosystem benefits, water, the individual beings, and the connection that we have are included and stay within the negotiations and don't get put aside? Bill, are you able to speak to that? Yeah, a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, so Nathan, uh, Jay, and myself are part of the negotiations team, and it is our job on behalf of the nations we work for to make to achieve exactly what you, you've described. But we, it's not just us, there's also with each from each nation a team, and uh, that team, three or four individuals, um, sits on the negotiation advisory team, which involves all five governments. And uh, yeah, we, we work hard, we have considerable discussions, and we've developed uh, quite a few different ways to uh, attempt to address um, impacts to Indigenous cultural values on uh, from the Columbia River Treaty. So we're working really hard. And that's our job uh, to do that. And, you know, the other part of it, is, as noted in my written response, is that, uh, as Jay said, we are participant observers in the negotiating team, and we carry that job right to the negotiating team. Thanks. Thanks so much, Bill. And Barb, would you like to share some perspectives from the US side? Yeah, again, again, with the caveat that I am not officially a part of the negotiating team, but there was on the US side, there was a, a, a formal process of review prior to the commencement of negotiations. And that process ended in 2013 with a regional recommendation. And in that process, led by bon Bonneville Power and the Army Corps, uh, there was put together what was called the Sovereign Review Team. And it had five representatives from the 15 uh, Indian reservations on the US side of the border. And it had one representative from each of the four main states. And that regional, so, so they had, there was um, Native American input into that. It also had a Sovereign Review technical team um, that had representation from each of those entities. The regional recommendation, according to the um, State Department website, is still the, um, the document that is guiding their positions in negotiations. Um, and, and then the extent to which the, the team consults with both tribes, members of Congress, and states um, would not be something that, that I would have any knowledge to speak to. Thanks very much, Barb. Uh, so there's some other questions coming up. Maybe I'll ask one more um, and then pass it over to Lynn, who I know has been monitoring the questions. Uh, but there's a question here, if the due process of negotiations runs past the end date of the existing treaty, is the existing treaty grandfathered? And I'm not sure, Corey or Barb, if one of you would like to respond or one of our uh, previous panelists. I'll leave it open. Well, I I can um, I can answer that because it's a very good question, and um, so the, the, if we if we the current treaty does not expire, right? There's one part of it that changes in 2024 where we go from a assured flood risk management regime to a more ad hoc regime, flood risk management regime called called upon. So if in, in the eventuality that, that 2024 comes and we haven't been able to finalize uh, a, a renewal of the treaty, the treaty goes on, right? 
there are provisions. Kathy said earlier, there are some provisions on called upon that are maybe not as clear as we would like them to be, um, but but the treaty doesn't doesn't end. It just keeps going, but the flood risk management regime will become different. That's the difference. So it's it's not grandfathered. It just remains in force. Thanks very much, Sylvain. And I see my lawyer nodding, so it must be true. <laughs> uh, Lynn, I know you've been monitoring the Q and A's. What other questions do we have? Sure thing. Thanks, Brooke. Um, does Canada have energy representation? Whoops, I lost that question. One second. Does Canada have energy representation on the negotiation team, i.e., Natural Resources Canada? We are we are uh, constantly keeping our um, colleagues in other government departments and agencies uh, on top of what we do. We when we have formal rounds, before the rounds, we explain what we're going to be talking about and welcome comments. Uh, but uh, we had for a while someone from the Department of Energy who was on the who attended some of the rounds now that person has moved on um it's 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 open we're we're, we're trying to limit the size of the, of the negotiating delegation but it's it's not close to them but we do have people from uh, ECCC the department of environment and and fisheries especially when we discuss issues that pertain more directly to them and I would like to just supplement by, by saying that uh, in 1964, the, uh, an agreement was signed between BC and Canada uh, to delegate the, the obligations and, and benefits of the treaty to the province. And, and in, in the treaty, it constructed a, uh, a, an entity's function to implement the treaty, which is uh, BC Hydro on the Canadian side. So they are charged with implementing the treaty as they have, uh, they, they, uh, operate uh, the the dams in the Columbia, uh, most of the dams, and and recalling that BC Hydro is a crown corporation of the province of BC. So the energy sector is is strongly represented at the negotiating table. Thank you. Thanks very much to both of you. Lynn, do we have another one? Yeah, for sure. I'm actually going to put two out there. Um, the first is, is there a dispute resolution mechanism for this treaty, like the softwood lumber agreement? That's the first question. The next question for the panel is, it seems clear already that the US intends to reduce the Canadian entitlement. BPA customers and Northwest Republicans are pushing that position hard. How will negotiation ne negotiators get past that? What's the first question you you, I, you mentioned softwood lumber, but I missed the beginning. Sorry. Sure, sure thing. Is there a dispute resolution mechanism for this treaty, like the softwood lumber agreement? Kathy or my lawyers can. can there is a, in the treaty a place for a dispute resolution if it doesn't work. Uh, it goes to the permanent engineering board of the treaty, and then if it doesn't work, there, it can go to the IJC. And then there are there's even a provision, Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong, for international arbitration. Should we disagree on something? It's never been used, but it, but in the case of a of a strong disagreement, it it could be used. And it's used it, it's used in if there are non compliances or disputes. Uh, in the current treaty implementation, but uh, there are no dispute resolution mechanisms to uh, in the development or modernization or changes to an existing treaty. That is the, the purview of the governments governments on both sides of the border. Yeah, and and the second question is, oh yeah, well of course it's a negotiation. Everybody wants more or less depending on their point of view, and and. Uh, and, you know, without going into details, what Canada is interested in is an overall basket of, of Canada. I mean, the Canadian side, that includes BC, is, is something that takes into consideration, in, into consideration the overall benefit sharing of the treaty, right? So it's not just about the entitlement. It's about 
FRM, it's about flexibility for ecosystems, etc. So it, it's the whole thing. It's, it's not just we don't take uh, and we shouldn't take any part of, of the treaty in isolation, right? You kind of have to take them in isolation for a minute when you discuss them, but nothing is agreed until the overall is agreed. And we make sure that, that uh, you know, that we get what we want from that treaty, from, from the modernized treaty. Thanks very much, Sylvain. So we have uh, four minutes left, time for maybe one more question before we wrap up. Lynn, do you have something for us? Sure. Um, if, if there is a conflict, does the new Columbia Water Treaty supersede the Water Treaty of 1909, the Boundary Waters Treaty? I'll let my lawyer handle that one. I say my lawyer. I say that as a joke. Our lawyer. I'm, I'm the Canadian government's lawyer. Um, I'm the Crown's lawyer. Um, the, the the question is if could you repeat it again? Uh, there there is there is a question it, it related to the CRT and the Boundary Waters Treaty. So the question is if there is a conflict, does the new Columbia Water Treaty supersede the Water Treaty of 1909? So would any new treaty we negotiate supersede the Boundary Waters Treaty? Uh, it, I mean, it would really depend on what the new treaty says. Right. It depends on what we negotiate in there. We would. Uh, it's one of the things that the negotiators will have to think about how the the new Columbia River Treaty would interact with the existing Boundary Waters Treaty. Right now, uh, the Colum the existing Columbia River Treaty has sort of fills the vacuum that might otherwise be filled by the Boundary Waters Treaty if there were no existing Columbia River Treaty. Um, for those who may not know, the Boundary Waters Treaty is a 1909 agreement between Canada and the United States. At, at the time, it was Great Britain and the United States, and it was meant to uh, resolve boundary water disputes across the Canada-U.S. border about the levels of water and about pollution of waters. Um, but it doesn't have a, a significant application at this time. It doesn't have a significant application to the Columbia River itself. So a new treaty would would have to take that into consideration. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Barb. I, I'll just add to that with um, the work that I did with Nigel Banks at UCalgary Calgary when we were looking at what would happen if, say, the Columbia River Treaty was terminated. Then the, the Boundary Waters Treaty would be in place kind of as a, a backdrop um, behind it, but but the current Columbia River Treaty supersedes that mainly because, as Corey says, the the Boundary Waters Treaty speaks to specifically to some of the water bodies shared by the U.S. and Canada, but not to the Columbia River. So it it really fills a, a gap, and I, it's hard for me to imagine where the two would come into come into conflict. Um, but the general rule, if there is a conflict, is that the latter enacted, uh, you were on notice that the former one existed and, and the later enacted uh, law supersedes. Thank you very much. So we are at eight o'clock Pacific time. I see uh, there's, there's a raised hand and there's for sure unanswered questions. Uh, you guys are very inquisitive, wonderful. Thank you so much for your participation. So I encourage you, if you haven't had your question answered, email it to us at Columbia River Treaty at gov.bc.ca. We'll put that up at the end here uh, and we'll get back to you. But at this point, I'd like to thank absolutely everybody for participating. Um, a, a heartfelt thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time and energy to be here tonight. I know it's a lot of dense information to uh, squish into two hours. Um, we'll hold more sessions like this, I'm sure, over time. Uh, oh, and Kathy has her hand up, so please. I have yep. a question for you, Brooke. Yep. So, so um, is, it, is it possible to... Uh, allow some of us to just uh, for a short time continue answering the questions in the Q&A without the meeting continuing. Can we do that? 
Or so definitely the meeting would continue, uh, but we would all turn our cameras off. So we wouldn't yeah. be engaging, but if folks still wanted to pay attention to the Q&A, we'll leave that open for a bit of time. Yeah, um, there, are 15, there are 15 more questions and I, I just, I so appreciate how lively the, the interaction has been back and forth and with answers from uh, Chief Crow and Bill and, and others. So uh, I'm happy to stay a little longer and finish answering the questions. <laughs> Don't send any more yet, and we will answer them by email, and we'll post it on our website. So all of your answers, all of your answers will be questions. All your questions will be answered. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kathy. Absolutely. Uh, so, so there you go. So folks who want to stay on and keep monitoring Kathy's responses to the questions, go for it. Um, otherwise, again, thank you so much to everybody, uh, panelists who want to feel free to turn on your camera and, and wave goodbye. Um, a recording of this session, of course, will be available on our website uh, in the next little while. And please watch for a survey that will come to your email. We'd love to hear your feedback on this session, on any other issues you want to hear about. Uh, so please check that out. And then, of course, always feel free to email us, Columbia River Treaty at gov.bc.ca. Um, and finally, a reminder to join our next info session on June 15th to hear about the incredible work that's happening to explore uh, potential changes to the treaty that could benefit ecosystems in the Columbia Basin. That'll be a really jam-packed, uh, amazing session. So I'll, I'll put the link to that in the chat before we sign out here. Otherwise, thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody and wish you all uh, a wonderful evening. Thanks, Brooke. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you. Take good care.